blessed and pleasant morning, brothers and sisters in Christ, and welcome to another edition of Morning Prayer, brought to you by the Anglican Diocese. Today is Thursday, the 14th day of March in 2024, and outside is overcast with a very angry sea and wind that looks like a storm is coming, but I see no real evidence of rain. I could use some rain. My car needs a little wash on the outside. I hope you're having a wonderful morning where you are this morning. We're going to kick things off this morning with this one entitled, Lord God, we thank you. Now the night is Short and sweet and to the point. That one done there by a quartet of Donna Seda, Laura, Helgren, Gay, 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 and Bob Mangles. All right, let's continue then getting our words to prepare up on screen for today, the 14th day of March, and today is Thursday. Let's see if I can make this happen. And should be up and running now from what I could see on my end. It should be up and running. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding, steadfast love, and repents of words from Joel chapter 2, verse 13. Using versicle 1 on page 35, Blessed be the Lord our God, by whose grace we are yet alive. Blessed be his Son, Jesus Christ, by whose rising we are set free. Blessed be the Spirit of God, in whom is our hope and departure. Our invitatory prayer, Father, we come together in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. To offer you our worship, praise, and thanks you. To you belong all power and glory. You are the source of our goodness. Let our worship bear witness to your presence and power. Through your Spirit, we may ever rejoice in the abiding presence of our risen and the same question. Our first canticle for this morning is the canticle, The Song of the Redeem, which is based on Revelation chapter 15, verse 3 and O ruler of the universe, Lord God, great deeds are they that you have done, surpassing human understanding. Your ways are ways of righteousness and truth, King of all the ages. Who can fail to do you homage, Lord, and sing the praises of you? For you only are the holy. All nations will draw near and fall down before you, because your just and holy works have been revealed. At this time, we pause to call to mind those things that, in thought, word, or deed, we may have committed, things that might have been displeasing to our mighty God, things that might have been unjust to our neighbors, or things perhaps that might have been unkind, bent to our very selves. For these times and these moments, Lord, pray to you for the forgiveness of our sins. Together we pray. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of light, to the honor and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Set us free, O oh God, from the bondage of our sins, and give us the liberty of that abundance which you have made known to us in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with human unity of the Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Up next, we have our reading of the psalm, and our psalm for this morning comes from Psalm 69, verse 1 to 23, and 31 to the 38. Let's have a listen. The psalm for today is Psalm 69, verses 1 to 23 and 31 to 38. Save me, O God, for the waters have risen up to my neck. I am sinking in deep mire, and there is no firm ground for my feet. I have come into deep waters, and the torrent washes over me. I have grown weary with my crying. My throat is inflamed. My eyes have filled from looking for my God. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. My lying foes who would destroy me are mighty. Must I then give back what I never stole? God, you know my foolishness and my faults are not hidden from you. You let those who hope in you be put to shame through me. Lord God of hosts, let not those who seek you be disgraced because of me, O God of Israel. Surely for your sake have I suffered reproach, and shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my own kindred, an alien to my mother's children. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. The scorn of those who scorn you has fallen upon me. I humbled myself with fasting, but that was turned to my reproach. I put on sackcloth also, and became a byword among them. Those who sit at the gate murmur against me, and the drinkers make songs about me. But as for me, this is my prayer to you. At a time you have set, O Lord, in your great mercy, O God, answer me with your unfailing help. Save me from the mire. Do not let me sink. Let me be rescued from those who hate me and out of the deep waters. Let not the torrent of waters wash over me. Neither let this deep swallow me up. Do not let the pit shut its mouth upon me. Answer me, O Lord, for your love is kind. In your great compassion, turn to me. Hide not your face from your servant. Be swift and answer me, for I am in distress. Draw near to me and redeem me, because of my enemies deliver me. You know my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor. My adversaries are all in your sight. Reproach has broken my heart, and it cannot be healed. I looked for sympathy, but there was none. For comforters, but I could find no one. They gave me gall to eat. And when I was thirsty, they gave me vinegar to drink. As for me, I'm afflicted and in pain. Your help, O oh God, will lift me up on high. I will praise the name of God in song. I will proclaim his greatness with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an offering of oxen, more than bull blocks with horns and hoofs. The afflicted shall see and be glad. You who seek God, your heart shall live. For the Lord listens to the needy, and his prisoners he does not despise. Let the heavens and the earth praise him, the seas and all that moves in them. For God will save Zion and rebuild the cities of Judah. They shall live there and have in, in possession. The children of his servants will inherit it, and those who love his name will dwell therein. We want to thank Miss Peyton Lennon White for reading for us this morning the psalm. And she's reading in memoria of Mrs. Sylvia Lennon Sam and in celebration of the birthday of our sister, Miss Josephine Ellis. Our second canticle for this morning is the Canticle de Benedictus, which is based on Luke chapter 1, verse 6 to 8 to 79. Blessed are you, Lord the God of Israel. You have come to your people and set them free. You have raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of your servant. Through your holy prophets, you promised of all to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us, to show mercy to our forebears and to remember your covenant. This was the oath you swore to our father, Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship you without fear, holy and righteous before you all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the for you will go before the Lord to prepare the way, 
to give God's people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine upon those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the world. Up next, we have our Bible reading, and our Bible reading comes from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 27, chapter 8, verse 27, to chapter 9, verse 1. I know where I get that from. Mark 8, 27 to 9, verse 1. And leading us in the reading is Miss Shifana Flowers in honor of the birthday of Miss Jones. Let's have a listen. The New Testament lesson is taken from Mark 8, 27 to 39 and Mark 9, verse 1. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist. Others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, raise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and what will for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Mark 9, and he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste Death until they see that the kingdom of God has come with power. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We want to thank Miss Shafana and Miss Peyton for reading for us this morning in honor of the birthday of our sister, Miss Josephine Bowers. To afford me a couple of seconds to get back to the beginning of the reading, we should be there and it should be up on the screen. This is, of course, Mark chapter 8 verse 27 through to mark chapter 9 verse 1 and it's coming to a conclusion there of mark chapter 8 and it ends with a theme that we have discussed before um we heard the last time right here in the gospel of mark where herod and the pharisees and scribes were trying to figure out the authority of jesus and herod had concluded that while people were saying Jesus was a prophet or Jesus was the rebirth of Elijah. Herod was thinking more that Jesus could possibly be headed John the Baptist that he would have um, that he would have had killed. And here we see in Peter's confession of Jesus being the Messiah, Jesus asking a similar question of who people were saying that he was. And he's moving now from where he was, headed to Caesarea Philippi. And he's having a conversation, you know, they didn't have any minibus to go anywhere. So they had their legs or they were They were walking. And so along the journey, the conversation came up with Jesus and his disciples asking, well, who are people saying that I am? 
who are people thinking I am based on what they have seen and experience of me and based on the experience of the people the disciples were telling jesus you know what people are thinking exactly what was said before that you could be john the baptist or that you could be elijah or maybe that you're one of the other prophets that used to live before now john the baptist would have been in jesus's time and jesus would have been alive when they killed john the baptist so that was a completely ridiculous idea him being the rebirth of elijah could have been a possibility simply because Elijah did not die. You remember Elijah was taken up in the chariot of fire and he went into heaven very much alive. And so people were thinking Elijah could come back or maybe just another one of the prophets reverted was what people were thinking. And it's interesting because what Jesus does next, yes. And remember, Jesus is not asking the question because he doesn't know who he is or because he has... Um, some kind of dependency on the opinion of other people. He's asking the question as an introduction to a more important follow-up question. And the more important follow-up question than wondering who people say he was, was asking the disciples who they thought he was. Now, remember yesterday, we were with the disciples who, for whatever reason, were lacking in their faith and based on all they had seen, had still not been able to understand and recognize all the things that Jesus was trying to tell them. And he had asked them the question, do you have ears but still do not hear? Do you have eyes but still do not see? Yeah? Have you been with me this long and you're worried about the right thing, wrong things? Your mind is not set on the right things. And based on what Jesus had said to them then, it is easy for me to understand why Jesus would be asking them the question of, who do they think that he is? Because if they can't recognize based on all they have experienced and all they have done in his name, that he is capable of doing so much, then something is wrong. Their understanding of his ministry is definitely off. Yeah, It was fine for the disciples to know what other people thought about Jesus, but Jesus had to ask them as individuals, what they believed about him. And interesting enough, remember when they saw Jesus walking towards them while they were on the storm in the boat? You remember how they were afraid? You remember how they asked themselves, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? They had an idea based on the fact that they had experienced certain things but it was still in the hardness of their heart. That's all I'm going to say. I saw the question becomes important. And Peter gives this answer. Now remember, Peter in one account of the walking on the water is the one who would have come out of the boat after saying to Jesus, command me to walk to you and I will. And he did walk until he got distracted and started to sink and then felt he was going to drown. Peter would have exhibited, I guess if I could say it like this, the most faith of all the twelve. And so when Peter gave the answer, you are the Messiah. Hmm? It, Peter knew the opinion of the crowd, and though complimentary towards Jesus, it was inaccurate. Jesus was much more than John the Baptist. He was much more than Elijah. He was much more than any other prophet. He was more than the national reformer or troublemaker that the Pharisees and Herod wanted to see him as. He was more than a miracle worker. He was more than any other prophet. He was, is the Christ. He is the Messiah. And that's what Peter said. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. No, calling Jesus the Messiah was the right, pardon me, was the right thing that Peter did was right on the money, but it was easily misunderstood. In the thinking of the people in Jesus' day, the Messiah was a political and natural superhuman. Come to deliver them from the hand of Rome. Come to break them free of the shackles the way Moses did. Hmm? And remember, towards the close of the Old Testament period, this Messiah, this anointed one, denoted an ideal king who would come empowered by God to 
deliver his people and establish his righteous kingdom. But for them, it was all a political circumstance. They were not thinking on heavenly things. They were thinking on earthly things. And when Peter says you are the Messiah, Jesus warns them to not tell anyone about him. Not because he was afraid, because he knew what the Pharisees and Herod would do if they came to the conclusion that he was the Messiah. They would see him as a threat. They already saw him as a threat. And seeing him as a threat would mean greater pressure on him to get rid of him. And we know how that will play out. That will happen. And he tries to go on to explain to them that his messiahship is not about religious, it's not about, it's not about um, secular rule. It's about religious transformation, spiritual transformation. He begins to teach them that the Son of Man has to undergo suffering and be rejected by the elders, be rejected by the chief priests, be rejected by the scribes, and eventually be killed. But that after three days he would raise again. And he gives them plainly his mission. His mission was to come, to die, and then rise again. That was the necessary work of the Messiah. It was predicted in Isaiah 53 that the Messiah must come and die, and then after his death, rise again. And the suffering and death of Jesus was a must for two great reasons. Man's sin and God's love. While Jesus' death was going to be the ultimate example of man's sin against God, it was also, it is also, the supreme expression of God's love for man. John 3.16. And if you join me for a Bible study this evening, we're going to be looking at John 3.16. Yeah? It was our sins that made it necessary for Jesus to go to the cross. But it was God's love for us that made the cross not just an instrument of cruel death, but an example of life and love. And Jesus explains, this is what the Messiah is about. And he does so openly. And I could imagine it being an unbelievable shock for anyone who was hoping and thinking that Jesus was the national and political Messiah. No? It is as if one would be thinking that the American presidential campaign would announce towards the end of his campaign that he would go to Washington and be rejected and then be killed. Ain't nobody thinking that. Ain't nobody thinking that at all. Yeah? Everybody's thinking, you know what? Um, when this guy gets there, He's going to bring such change. It's going to be a big thing. And to hear that the guy that you are putting all your hopes upon to bring about change is to hear him say, yeah, I am the Messiah, but I got to get beaten up first. I am the Messiah. I'm going to get killed. I am the Messiah. It ain't going how you plan. Ain't nobody want to hear that, Jesus? A suffering Messiah? Unthinkable. The Messiah was a symbol of strength and power, and authority. Not one of weakness to be overthrown by these little people. Not at all. So that didn't go down well with them. And Peter, who had just professed that he was the Messiah, who had just proclaimed out loud that, yeah, this is who we know you are, Peter takes Jesus aside. And I like that Peter took him aside, you know, because Peter didn't rebuke him in front of the rest. There was at least some dignity that Peter wanted. Peter's intent was love for Jesus. Of course, he was unwillingly being used by Satan. Yeah? And you don't have to be demon-possessed for Satan to use you. You simply need to let your guard down and you could be unwittingly used. All right? Yeah. It works that way. And Peter pulls him aside. Yeah? He doesn't do it in front of the rest of the boys. But he just confessed that Jesus is the Messiah. Peter was complimented by Jesus for doing so, telling him in the other version that flesh and blood did not reveal that, but that it was God. But then 
hearing of Jesus' impending suffering, death, and resurrection, Peter felt that it couldn't be right. He believed he had heard from God. He believed that God told him he was the Messiah. So this Messiah couldn't end that way. So Peter rebuked Jesus. And it's interesting that Peter was bold enough to pull his teacher aside and say to him, eh -eh, stop talking this foolishness. What are you talking about? Bold of Peter to do that. It shows that he had enough confidence in his relationship with Jesus to try to correct who was his master. And he did. And Jesus had to rebuke him. Peter was confident that God had told him what was right and that Jesus had to be wrong in saying that he would have to suffer, die, and rise again. He was confident in his ability to hear from God. Maybe too confident. Maybe too confident. And even though he was right, and even though he was his confidence in hearing from God is set in the right place, his understanding of what he heard was off. Because his mind was still thinking of an earthly Messiah. His mind was not thinking on heavenly things. And that is what Jesus had to tell him. Get behind me, Satan. Your mind is not set on divine things. Your mind is set on This was a strong rebuke from Jesus. But it was absolutely necessary and appropriate. Though a moment before, Peter spoke as a messenger of God by calling Jesus rightly the Messiah. He spoke as a messenger of Satan to try to rebuke Jesus. And Jesus knew that there was a satanic purpose in discouraging from his ministry, in discouraging him from his ministry on the cross. And he could not allow that purpose to succeed. And so Peter, unaware that he spoke for Satan, yeah, very much aware that he was speaking for God and calling him a Messiah, but not while we do Jesus. Huh? It's not mindful of what he was saying. He's not mindful of the things of God. He was thinking simply in the way of men. Not my Messiah. My Messiah has to be glorified. My Messiah has to be healed by all. And his Messiah would be, just not in the context of what he thought. Peter is a perfect example of how a sincere heart coupled with man's thinking can often lead to problems, maybe a dictatorship. Your heart is in the right place, yes? Your, your heart is in the right place. You're, you're sincere and wanting to get things done for your people. But thinking from a man perspective without being a spiritual leader, without being guided by the hand of God, you could create many problems. Peter couldn't handle a suffering Messiah. He rebuked Jesus. And in turn, had to be rebuked by Jesus. And Jesus goes further to talk not only of his difficulties and hardships that he would face, but he calls the crowd along with the disciples. He explains to them, you're going to have to take up your cross too. If you want to be my followers, you're going to have to deny yourself. You're going to have to take up your cross and you're going to have to go through some of the hardships that I will go through. Will not be the same. Will not be as intense. But you will be criticized that they criticize me. You will be judged unjustly like they unjustly judge me. You will suffer persecution like they will persecute me. You're going to have to take up your cross and be willing to go through these things like the suffering Messiah in order to get to the rewards of the eternal life. That's it. It's bad enough for the disciples to hear that Jesus would suffer and be rejected and die on the cross. Now he's telling them that they have to endure the same thing. And to deny yourself and take up the cross, everybody knew what Jesus meant. Everyone knew that the cross at that time was an unrelenting instrument of death. It had no other purpose. The cross wasn't about religious ceremony. It wasn't about tradition and, and, and spiritual feeling. It was a way of execution. That's it. 
Jesus was essentially telling them, I'm going to walk down death row and you're going to have to walk down death row daily if you choose to follow me. And know that taking up your cross is not a journey, it's a one-way trip. Because you ain't coming back from that. This life. And it's a decision in knowing that it's a one-way trip to still take that journey with Christ. And that's the journey we are called. We are called to remember that cross-bearing does not refer to some irritations in life. Yeah? It involves the way of the cross. A man condemned, requiring to carry the cross all the way to the place of execution. As Jesus was required, so we are required. And I think we miss it sometimes. We miss the fact that it is not small irritation. Carrying my cross leads to death and condemnation by this world. It means giving up on all that I want to hold onto in this life, but clinging the message and the teachings and the way of life showed to us in the examples of Christ. That's where the denying of the self come from. Denying of the self equals with the taking up of the cross. The cross wasn't about self-promotion or self-affirmation. A person carrying a cross knows that they can't save themselves because the final end is death. Jesus knew that. And denying yourself, remember, is not the same as self-denial. You know? We practice self-denial when for a good purpose we occasionally give up things like during Lent but we deny ourselves when we surrender ourselves completely to the will of God through Jesus Christ and we become determined to obey him there's a difference between self-denial and denying of self Jesus wasn't telling them to practice self-denial and give up certain things for a period of time. He was telling them, deny yourself. You do not belong to you. Do not consult you on anything. Know that whatever you deem as worthy in this life has no meaning or consequence. Nothing is as important as me. And it doesn't only tell them that the cross is a road and a journey they will have to take. It doesn't only tell them what the difference between self-denying and denying self means. It tells us why we must take up our cross and follow. And understanding the why is important. Those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. And then my favorite verse from Mark chapter 8, 36. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? The message is simple. You must follow Jesus in this way. Because while this is the road to certain death, it is the only way. We will ever find life. And it sounds strange, huh? You will never know how to live until you learn to die, Christ. But you can't gain resurrection unless you die first. And modern day people put it, everybody wants to go to heaven, nobody wants to die. You see, we forget that we do not lose a seed when we plant it in the ground. Though it might seem dead and buried. Instead, that dead and buried seed is set free and will be what it was always intended. And just like Jesus, when they thought they were burying him because he was dead, 
yeah, guys, they were planting a seed. And that when he sprung up from there, it was going to be bigger and better. The message of Jesus and the works of Jesus that he did in those three years before they buried him. When he rose from that tomb, healing still continued. Resurrection still continued. Preaching and teaching still continued. And 2,000 years after they thought they finished him. Praise Jesus. Still We are a part of that legacy. We are called to continue that work. To daily remember to take up our cross and encourage others to do the same. That the kingdom business would continue. We are called to give our lives all the Christ. Living with others as the center of our focus because doing so means serving Christ as the true center. Christ didn't come for glory in this world. He's coming again in glory. And we will see him if we deny ourselves the flesh the devil and the world. And we choose to take up our cross and follow him. It is the only way we can share in his glory. It is the only way we can share in it. The question remains, what's your choice? Will you wish to gain the whole world now and forfeit your soul? Or are you willing Deny yourself. Take up your place. In perfect that no one can see. There you must choose. Because tomorrow is promised to be. What will you expect? What will people say? And he will prove that. Let us continue with the profession of our faith. Words of the apostles. Together we say, I be Father Almighty, the creator of heaven. And I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was there. Ascended to On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and he seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge living. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, and of saints. Forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, life everlasting. The Lord be with you. As our Savior has taught us, so let us be taught to Our Father in heaven, our Lord be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from him. For the kingdom of the power and the power are yours, now and forever. For our suffrages, we use suffrage people. Lord, reveal your love among us, that we may know the joy of your salvation. Grant peace within and among all nations, and teach our leaders wisdom. Endow your church with faith, and your servants with knowledge and true godliness. Defend, O Lord, the rights of the poor and the oppressed, that your justice may be made. Lord, renew your spirit within us, that in us and through us your will may be done. Our collet for today is the collet for the fourth Sunday in Let us pray. 
gracious Father, whose blessed Son came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world. Evermore give us this bread, that he may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Together we say a prayer for the poor and the dead. Almighty and most merciful God, we remember before you all poor and neglected persons whom it would be easy for us to forget, the homeless and the destitute, the old and the sick, and all who have none to care for them. Help us to heal those who are broken in body and spirit and to turn our sorrow into joy. Grant this, Father, for the love of your Son, and for our sake with him, Jesus Christ our Lord. Today in our World Cycle of Prayer, we remember and pray for the people of Cambodia, and in our ecumenical cycle, cycle of prayer, we pray for our sisters and brothers who are members of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Romania. At this time, we turn to our prayers of personal intercessions and thanks. This morning, we extend birthday greetings to the following individuals. We remember and greet birthday greetings to Ms. Rosa Monquero, Ms. Nancy Aguilar, Mr. John Moquel, Ms. Josephine Flowers, Mr. Joseph Roches, Ms. Christina Saldana, and Mrs. Chantel Pizzo. We pray, ladies and gentlemen, that you have a blessed and beautiful birthday, and that indeed God's blessings will continue to be upon you, not just for your birthdays, but for all the remaining days of your lives. Happy birthday! May we remember in memoria Miss Sylvia, Lennon Sam, and Mr. Bassington. In our prayers, we continue to give Almighty God thanks for persons who have recovered from illness and surgery, and we continue to pray for healing and recovery of the following. We remember and pray for Miss Judith, Miss Eileen, Miss Molly, Miss Rose, Miss Grace, Miss Celine, Miss Maria, Miss Norma, Miss Mary, Miss Kim, and Miss Joyce. Lee. We pray for Miss Monica, Miss Sylvia, Miss Des, Miss Aisley, Miss Justine, Miss Lisa, Miss Soyla, Miss Beryl, Miss Janet, Miss Marley, and Miss Toya. We pray for Miss Nelita, Miss Molly, Miss Venancia, Miss Amelia, Miss Crystal, Miss Martine, Miss Alma, Miss Dylan, Miss Janice, Miss Myrna, and Miss Margaret. We pray for Miss Betty, Miss Martha, Miss Marva, Miss Gloria, Miss Celestina, Miss Jessica, Miss Sean, Miss Althea, Miss Teresa, Miss Amy, and Miss Marie. We pray for Miss Felicia, Miss Salome, Miss Helena, Miss Janice, Miss Yolanda, Miss Arlet, Miss Ruby, Miss Barbara, Miss Loretta, Miss Lena, Miss Agnes, Miss Priscilla, Miss Jean, Miss Alma, Miss Maud, Miss Elma, Miss Delvarine, Miss Marie, Miss Geraldine, Miss Myrtle, Miss Sonia, and Miss Petro. In our prayers, we continue to remember and pray for Miss Verilyn, Miss Carol, Miss Jasmine, Miss Alair, Miss Nina, Miss Leonor, Miss Tanya, Miss Robin, Miss Patricia, Miss Camille, Miss Kira, Miss Joyce, Miss Marcia, Miss Ismay, Miss Joel, Miss Ulichi, Miss Lisa T, Miss Rita, Miss Louise, Miss Fiona, Miss Carolyn, Miss Kathy, Miss Kelly, Miss Felina, Reverend Fiona, Miss Sharon, Miss Elva, Miss Nadia, Miss Eleanor, Miss Lynette, Miss Laurel, Miss Shelmady, Ms. Dominique, Ms. Tanisha, Ms. Brenda G, Ms. Bernadine, Ms. Sandra, Ms. Gretel, and Ms. Sheila. Pray for Ms. Irene, Ms. Pat, Ms. Michelle, Ms. Sophie, Ms. Jean, Ms. Angela, Ms. Perla, Ms. Amy, Ms. Maisie, and Ms. Tracy. We pray for Ms. Charlene, Ms. Megan, Ms. Tessa, Ms. Davis, Ms. Julianne, Ms. Shanice, Ms. Kimberly, Ms. Susan, and Ms. Dorothy. In our prayers, Continue to remember and pray for Mr. Z and Mr. Larry, Mr. Kenrick, Mr. Wilfred, Mr. Marvin, Mr. Philip, Father Eric, Mr. Jeffrey, Mr. Tony, Mr. Gary, Mr. Belhem, Mr. Ian, Mr. Edmundo, Mr. Charles, Mr. Dion, Mr. Freddie, Mr. Oscar, Mr. Costa, Mr. Finley, and Mr. Dudley. We pray for Mr. Leroy Jr., Mr. Rupert, Mr. Enrique, Mr. Robert, Mr. Rodney, Mr. Ismail, Mr. Clement, Mr. Walter, Mr. Edgar Jr., Mr. Carlos, Mr. Pablo, Mr. Dion, Mr. Alfred, Mr. Bert, 
Mr. Lyndon, Mr. Mark, Mr. Emmett, Mr. Clinton, Mr. Lewis, and Mr. Shaw. Pray for Mr. Peter H., Mr. Ambrose, Mr. Pitel, Mr. Soberanis, Mr. Samuels, Sir Colville, Mr. Donald, Mr. Kurt, Mr. Roslan, Father Constancia. We remember and pray for Mr. Gustavo, Mr. Lincoln, Mr. Grayson, Bishop Curry, Mr. J. Mar, Mr. Dave, Mr. Trevor, Mr. Chris, Mr. Ernest, Father Mark, David, Mr. Carmen, Mr. Peter, Mr. Albert, Mr. Omar, Mr. Jervis, Mr. Irving, Mr. Richard, Mr. Lloyd, Mr. Kieron, Mr. Devin, Mr. Anini, Bishop Wright, Mr. Clayton, Mr. Paul, and Mr. Ted. In our prayers, we continue to pray for healing for persons who are currently infected with COVID-19, those in their various forms of isolation, and those who care for persons in isolation. Continue to give God thanks for the availability of a vaccine, even as we pray for the containment and the elimination of this COVID-19. In our prayers, we continue to remember and pray for all of our medical professionals in their various duties, in their various institutions, both public or private institutions. We remember and pray especially for doctors Hidalgo, Molina, Monguia, Arnal, Manzanero, Ariaga, Shogreen, Ken, Arana, Joseph, Eck, Lawrence, Sosa, Young, Toyar, Flores, and Rosada. We remember and pray for our nurses, praying for Nurse McKin, Nurse Gill, Nurse Joyce Lynn, Nurse Lima, Nurse Olivia, Nurse Julie, Nurse Ashley, Nurse Kadoga, Nurse Aaron, Nurse Alberta, Nurse Herrera, Nurse Orel, Nurse Shirley, Nurse Alejandra, and Nurse Mugetsi. In our prayers, even as we pray for those who are infirm and those who care for them, we remember and pray for those who, for whatever reason, cannot pray for themselves. Remembering and praying together, Heavenly Father, giver of life and help, comfort and me with your sick servants, and give your power of healing to minister. That those for whom our prayers are offered may be strengthened in your weakness, have confidence in your loving care, and experience your healing. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. In our prayers, we continue to pray for comfort for those who are grieving the loss of a loved one. We remember and pray for Mr. Stephen Jurgensen. We pray for Mr. Isaac Zuniga, Mr. Marlon Basaro, Ms. Faye Gillett, Ms. Celia Mushjam, Ms. Lena Lopez, Ms. Diana Yard, Mr. William Pope, Mrs. Glenn, Gwendolyn Pope, Mr. Edwin Stevens, Mr. Delio Menzies, and Ms. Lamisha Moore. For all those who are grieving the loss of a loved one, we pray that Almighty God will grant you comfort during this time of bereavement, and we pray for eternal rest for those who In our prayers, I pray for those who are considered most vulnerable in our society. We remember and pray for the Elderly, persons with pre-existing health conditions, persons who find themselves in situations of abuse of any kind. We protection and provision over them, just as we pray for protection over our loved ones who are far away from us. We remember and pray for our students, praying for Elisa, Kami, Karina, Courtney, Akua, Randolph, Angel, Paige, Garrett, Freedom, Ashley, Rhea, Rihanna, Kai, Ariane, Jamal, and Tiffany. We remember and pray for our loved ones in the military. Praying for Jason, Emil, Prince, Candy, Christopher, Charles S., Charles C., Sam, Gavin, Shin, and Kelly. We remember and pray for our security forces. We remember and pray for our government, both municipal and local. We remember and pray for our churches and our church people. Pray for the private sector and for all non governmental organizations involved in any form of human As we pray for them, we remember and pray for the international community. Praying for those countries ravaged by the effects of war and civil unrest, those ravaged by the effects of natural disasters. As we pray for them and their various stages of recovery, we also pray for protection for ourselves and our region against the ravages of civil unrest and natural disasters. For the prayers of our hearts, if our things cannot confess, we pray that Almighty God would hear. 
We conclude our intercessions by praying together. Almighty and eternal God, sanctify and govern our hearts and bodies in the ways of your laws and the works of your commandments, that under your protection now and ever, we may be preserved in body and soul. Christ. By means of announcing my brothers and sisters, I want to thank you so much for joining me this morning for morning prayer. It is indeed a blessing and a privilege to be able to be teaching you in your presence as well, as in the presence of Almighty God. Today is Thursday, so our broadcast schedule for today includes following this broadcast, noonday prayer at midday, evening prayer at 5.30, Bible study via Zoom at 7.30, be under the code for the link on our Facebook pages, and then compline at 9 p.m. to close of the day. I invite you to join us for any or all of these services as you are available. And if you miss it at its scheduled broadcast time, do not be alarmed. <laughs> you simply need to visit the Facebook pages of the churches in the Anglican Diocese of Belize and you'll be able to catch a recap of this and all our scheduled broadcasts for today. I want to thank you so much for your continued support of the work and the ministry of the Anglican Diocese of Belize. We're going to wrap things up this beautiful Thursday morning with our prayer of dedication, followed by the grace, the dismissal, and then our final. So let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Ghost. May it be a lantern to our feet, a light to our hearts, and a strength to our lives. Take us and use us to love and to serve our persons, to the power of the Holy Spirit, and in the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Brothers and sisters, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. The Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks to God. We're going to close off this morning with one of my favorites, this one entitled, It is Well with My Soul. In Jesus' command to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him, we have to be willing to forsake the things of this world and cling to the things of the kingdom. And in doing so, we have to make a decision as to whether or not it is better for us to gain the whole world and lose our soul or for us to keep our soul as we reject, knowing that all is well with our soul. I do pray you have a blessed and beautiful day today. Please do all you can to keep yourself and your family safe. Until tomorrow morning, same place, same time. God bless. Okay.